Today I'm going to talk about, um, my title of, my, of the talk is Learning the Learner. It's kind of a funny title, or the long title is How to Use Machine Learning to Keep Track of the Performance of Machine Learning Algorithms. And actually last week when I was preparing for the talk, something happened and, and I saw something in the news which made me very happy because it, it really makes the point of what I'm trying to say here. Let me see which clicker works. Here we go. So the new title is How South Park Helped Me Make This Presentation. So more on that in a few slides. So I hope I got your attention now. All right. So let's see. For some reason, the top is shown. So m machine learning, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, used to be about you know, uh, researchers going to NIPS and ICML, publishing papers, uh, taking data sets from UCI Irvine. We were very happy about any percentage of uh, improvements. And, and basically, uh, when I graduated, when I, when I said I'm doing machine learning, people asked me, oh, so you're working on educational systems that help children learn uh, with machines? Uh, that's, that was the case. But yeah, there is a coming of age. I think uh, that we all see that, uh, well, this conference is a testament to that. Uh, machine learning and AI is now very much hyped, but not only hyped, there are real applications and real business value happening in a lot of different places, uh, anywhere from surveillance systems to autonomous, autonomous driving machines, uh, personal assistance and all these uh, uh, Echo and Google Home and Google Now and Siri and and you know and ads and recommendation engines. There are a lot of actual business value generated from machine learning applications and AI applications. Uh, and uh, as you know, you know, data scientist was voted the sexiest job in the 21st century a few a couple of years ago. Uh, there was an article about that. Um, all of a sudden, people doing machine learning like Andrew Ng are now, you know, they're superstars. So, so it's great. It's great to see that, and, uh, uh, and it, the, the greatest thing that it's bringing value. So, when you start approaching uh, a problem in machine learning, and this has always been the case, and it's, now it's really the, the practical machine learning process when you're creating a product or adding value to an existing uh, uh, product or process. You first go by defining a problem. What is, my pro what is the problem I'm trying to solve, a real world problem? I'm trying to do uh, intrusion detection using facial recognition, uh, intrusion detection uh, in, a, in a physical environment. Then I can use facial recognition and machine learning algorithms to solve that. So the process uh, of any, that any data scientist has to go through is understand the problem, understand what data to collect and start collecting it and preparing it. Uh, then train test models and go through lots and lots of iterations, whether, new, whether it's deep learning neural nets or other models, or even if it's just uh, neural nets, training it with you know, multi-layers and a lot of layers and trying out different algorithms until you're happy with the results and you believe that the results solves the problem you started, you started with. Then you go through the, the hard part of deploying it to production because this is a product, you want it to actually work in the world, it's not a research product project anymore. And then the fifth step is to actually continuously track and monitor it so you know that it's, that it's working. Uh, and if you need to, you go back to the drawing board and, uh, and go through the whole cycle again and again and again. So there is a race for automation of this whole process. Data scientists, machine learning experts are sparse. I mean, they're scarce. There aren't a lot. And there are a lot of tools out there that are trying to help improve, accelerate this whole process so companies can actually get the value as fast as possible and as auto automatically as possible. And the landscape, this is, this is from a year ago, but I think if that la the landscape of machine intelligence, of platforms and systems that are doing uh, uh, machine learning if we did this today, it's probably four times the size of this slide in terms of number of companies doing it. And it's good because that's, that's the way it should be. That shows that this area is maturing. But, and of course there is a but, otherwise my talk is, will not be interesting, uh, there is a fifth kind of overlooked step. 
uh, a lot of times overlooked by both machine learning practitioners, companies, uh, and products. Tracking and monitoring your, what, what works out there in the wild in production. How do you know that it's working as you expected when you trained it and you tested it and you trained it and tested it and, and did all these iterations? How do you know that it's still functioning as you expect it? It sounds trivial, right? Just track the performance of things and, and it will work, right? And if, if, it, if something doesn't work, I'll find out. But it's not that easy and, and I'll give you some examples of things that can go wrong in production and this is where South Park comes into play. So last week, South Park aired an episode uh, where they actually trolled Amazon Echo in a very, very funny way. Uh, so Cartman bought an Echo and he kept talking to that Echo the whole episode and funny things happened. Alexa, send alarm for 7 a.m. Alarm set for 7 a.m. Alarm set for 7 a.m. Tomorrow. Alexa, tell me a joke. What's black and Which white? Which Star Wars character is surprisingly good at this song? Alexa, Ezra, back to my shopping list. I've added scrotum bags to your shopping list. Scrotum bags added to your shopping list. Scrotum bags added to your shopping list. Scrotum bags added to your shopping list. So, so this goes and on, on and on and on and on throughout the episode, and and you know Alexa adds more and more things to the shopping list of the people at home. Thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices got all sorts of things added to it, like scrotum bags, and I won't read it, so I'm not sure if I, you know, this this is the shopping cart of the guy who posted that video, and you now have. 100,000 Alexas out there added all of this to their shopping bags, set alarm clock for 7 a.m. Well, I wonder why they didn't do, put, put like 3 a.m. just to make a joke of it, you know, see how many people woke up at 3 a.m. because of South Park. But basically, the, this was working fine, but you know, basically what they didn't think about is the vulnerability. So Alexa is, a, is AI, but it's a bit dumb because it doesn't understand context. It doesn't understand that somebody's fooling you. So that's one thing that can go wrong, being attacked. And there are a lot of examples of vulnerabilities like that that can be exploited uh, by you know, either funny things or malicious things. And I've heard of, of exploitations of, of actual autonomous cars where people put images at the side of the road and can cause a car to do stuff based on those images because they have image recognition. So you have to think about these things when you're building a system. Uh, it's not just my accuracy rate of the algorithm. It was perfect here, right? The accuracy was perfect. You can have, you can have algorithms that do classification, for example, that get wrong input features because something broke along the way, because the data that was being thrown into it in production as, it was, as it's running, it's garbage, and then you get garbage in, garbage out. This is a real case of, uh, of a company, an ATE company, they saw a drop in conversion and an increase in bid spent. They have algorithms that decide what to bid and how much to bid for every campaign for their customers. And they, they incurred a loss of $300,000 in just 10 hours. So basically they wasted six months worth of campaign dollars for one company in 10 hours because their algorithm was fed with wrong information and it was bidding like crazy. And nobody noticed. Why? Because they're running, those algorithms run by themselves, right? For uh, a thousand or 10,000 campaigns a day for a lot of different customers who can watch this. Nobody. And then, you know, you end up actually losing money. You have to, you either lose your customer or you lose, or you have to reimburse them. They lose confidence in you. Uh, there's a lot of, this is actually uh, a real case that happens. You can have biased training sets. You're, you're, training with, you're training with biased training sets, and then you get articles like this, how machine or taught by photos learns, learn, to be sexist, learn, to learn a sexist view of women. This is from a recent Wired article. You can have, uh, you, can have you, you might have trained to do certain classification, and all of a sudden there are new concepts that appear. You can have concept drift. So you trained on something, but it, the, the real world, the concepts actually changed along the way. You can have misclassification and so many, so many other things that can go wrong. This is another example, funny example from the news. Well, I don't know if it's funny, but uh, you know, the AI bot from Microsoft thought that you know, Obama was actually kissing, uh, holding a cell phone and, and described the dress as a cat with a tie. You know, so, so maybe they didn't train for 
you know, this uh, for, for Michelle Obama or for women. I'm, I'm not sure why it did that, but you have to detect those kind of things. So the, now the question is, how do you actually detect this? How do you actually track and monitor your machine learning algorithms in production? So the solution, so I, I'm the chief data scientist of Anodot. Anodot is an anomaly detection uh, company, which is not surprising why I'm saying this is the, this is the solution, but I'm going to show you why, why really I believe that you know, anomaly detection is the first step to really track and monitor your own machine learning applications and automate the process fully. So what is anomaly detection? Uh, anomaly detection time series. If you're able to measure something, it's basically any unexpected change in the temporal patterns for one or more time series signal. That's the very high level definition. So, so you can have a time series that looks like that, an unexpected change in pattern is that orange, or you can have multiple time series over there uh, representing number of users or visitors or the algorithm performance and an unexpected pattern change of that performance measure uh, is an anomaly that could indicate you have something going on that you need to pay attention to. So really the process is very simple. It's dead simple. So to monitor and track the output of machine learning algorithm, it's three steps. First, define what are the algorithm's performance metrics that you need to track uh, that could indicate either directly or indirectly that, that they, are as, they are working as you expect. Any deviation from a normal pattern in those could, sh you should pay attention to as a data science team. Second step is to actually continuously collect it from your algorithms running out there, all the models that you train that are running in production, uh, and make sure, and, and so track them and collect them. And then, uh, if you see any unexpected changes in the metrics, then uh, get alerted on that and investigate that. And eventually, once you see enough of these, you can start automating remediation action for them as well. It's not, it's not surprising. So some examples. For example, if, if, if I have these attacks of out-of-context results, for example, the Alexa, the Alexa example is a nice one. You could use, I mean, Amazon collects all, the, all of what Alex, all, the, all the echoes out there recognize. They collect it into to their platform all the time. If you actually track the output of those many devices and find anomalies in recognition rates or number of unknown class, classes or spikes uh, in rare outputs, you could detect that something is wrong and then stop it before it creates real damage. So the Alexa example could, would, would probably have looked like that. If, they, if you collect how many devices at any point in time set the alarm clocks, you would probably have seen a huge spike in, in the number of devices setting alarm clocks happening at the same time. That's, that's a, one indication something's wrong. You would probably want to know at the same time that the recognition rate of new products that don't exist also spiked up, right? Like the products that uh, I showed earlier. But even if it's an existing product that somebody adds to many, many shopping carts at the same time, so several months ago they had a case where a girl, uh, a girl actually uh, asked Alexa to purchase a dollhouse and, and the, the dollhouse arrived to their house. So that, that's hard to prevent. But then when they aired it on the news, they actually said the words, Alexa, buy a dollhouse, and then, they saw, then there was a spike in number of dollhouses added to many, many shopping carts. Uh, of Alexa users because it was on the news. So identifying those spikes, you, you can actually stop it, remove it from shopping carts and stop the damage from happening, your brand damage. I mean, it's a real, it could be a real, a real damage to your brand or even monetary damage if you have to, if it was shipped and then you have to return it. Um, so, so that's one example. Another example is, you know, looking at data integrity. You have Feature, you compute features out of data that comes in. You want to make sure that the data is good, that you don't put garbage into your uh, machine learning, trained machine learning algorithms, that, uh, models that you put out there. So this is, these are example features that are input to a classifier. And if you see an anomalous change in the distribution of some of the features, so the, the middle feature has no anomaly, everything is fine. The top features, have a change of pattern, and you want to be aware of that change of patterns because if that happens, you might it might need it might mean that you need to go and and look: are your algorithms still functioning as you think they should? 
you know, you, if you're doing classification and you, you have a way to get feedback from users, you can actually track the classification accuracy of classifiers. You can look, if you don't have a way to collect feedback about, you know, whether you made the right or wrong answer, if you're doing classification, you can even track the distribution of your classifiers, what type of classes they, they say. So each, this is a, a, a bar chart where each line is a time. What, what, what did my models do out there in the wild in terms of classification? Because again, you're probably not just, don't have just one model out there. You have a lot of models doing a lot of classification of cats, dogs, if it's images, or other things if it's, uh, if it's uh, other types of problems. And you can look and you can track the distribution of it. And if all of a sudden you see a change in that distribution, it might, need, might mean that you have new classes that you haven't thought about. It might mean that you have concept drifts. And you might go, have to go back and retrain your models now uh, based on that input. But if you're not aware of it, if you're not tracking this, then you're going to miss it. And this could last for a long time. And eventually, you get hit uh, as a business. All right, so I showed you examples where it looked easy, right? I mean, this is visually easy to spot, right? I mean, oh, this is easy to spot. This is very easy to spot. This is easy to spot. This is easy to spot. But reality is that you need really scale. You can't have, you can't have people looking at this all day long. Uh, you can't have a room full of monitors where you're going to look at all this because you're probably, if you're, if you are, uh, if you have just one model out there or very few, then you can track it manually. But if now ha you have millions of models in production, then it's going to be much, much harder to do that. This is a, I mean, we all wish that we could be Lucy. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Lucy, but you know, she gets all these signals and super cool how she looks at the signals and moves things around and finds what she needs in all this data, right? The reality is not Reality is that we can look at very few things at any point in time, and, and if you're a data science team, you probably don't have time to even look at anything because you're working on the next model and you're working on the next problem to solve. Uh, so, so what's the point of this? You need a system. You need a system that implements anomaly, automated anomaly detection uh, that can find all these unexpected behaviors of your machine learning algorithms. And that's, that's, really, uh, that's really the point of this talk. Now, let me give you an exa a real example of, 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 from Anadoc. So, so we build a platform that does anomaly detection, which means we implemented a lot of machine learning algorithms uh, that work in production on a lot, a lot of data. Just to give you a sense of what we do, uh, our, our automated anomaly detection has five steps. We start by collecting a lot of data and analyzing all of it on the stream, which means we have online learning algorithms working on data streams uh, and adapting constantly and then learning the normal behavior patterns of everything. And then we have, uh, and in this step, we actually have classification of signals. So we have classifiers there. We have algorithms that do seasonality detection. We have mixture model algorithms that we, that we estimate for every time series that comes in. We have statistical models that get estimated. We have an algorithm for frequency detection. So we have you know, about 15 algorithms running in parallel uh, just to do the normal behavior learning for all the time series that comes into our platform. The second step is to learn what we do, uh, is we learn also the behaviors of the anomalies and their patterns, and uh, so we can score them and classify them. And here we're using Bayesian models uh, for scoring, and we're using anomaly, anomaly type classification, uh, and we have all sorts of adaptation models, methods that are implemented in production as well all so we can find anomalies on the time series that come into our platform. Then we also do multivariate analysis of all the uh, anomalies that we find so we can group them together into a, into a concise story. Uh, and here we, we actually implemented various similarity algorithms. We use LSH heavily. We use clustering and soft clustering algorithms. We use stacked autoencoders to do various, uh, various transformations of the data and various feature transformations. So we have a set of algorithms working here as well. The last step is feedback, which also uh, has another set of learning algorithms. The point of this is that for us, our machine learning is 
anomaly detection. And to do it robustly and very, in a very high scale, we had to implement a lot of different algorithms uh, in production. Now, these algorithms run today uh, on 6 billion data points per day. We analyze 175 million unique time series constantly every day. Uh, 350 million models, different models that are deployed, sitting in memory, getting updated all the time, uh, based on 30 types of learning algorithms. Uh, so a lot of numbers, a lot of things happen, and, and they have to work together to produce at the end anomalies for our customers. Now, if we had to track them manually ourselves, we would get lost. I mean, our data science team is five people. We build all of this with five people. Well, we have R&D and we have data science, so everybody builds everything. But if, if the data science team had to manually track what's going on in production in terms of the algorithms, we would not do any work. We would never advance. So what, what did we do? Well, we took our system. We replicated it on the side. We started monitoring our algorithm. So every algorithm output, when it's working in production, we decided these are the performance measures that we need to track because they may indicate that there is something new going on that we, that's unexpected that we, are, we should be aware of. Uh, and then we implemented our own system on that to detect anomalies so we don't have to look at it manually. And the results, I mean, we, we get alerted you know, every day on various things and we react to it and it really makes our life so easier. Just to give you a few examples, uh, you know, this is an example where we had a deployment that caused an anomaly in how many in the distribution of the seasonality that we detected on the time series that came into our system. There was a spike. There were certain, certain seasons that were all of a sudden becoming uh, more prominent, and it wasn't reasonable. Uh, at the same time, we correlated that with uh, the model selection rate. So we have a classifier deciding different models for different metrics. And it started doing a lot more switching between models. And at the same time, we saw that the number of anomalies we discover for our customers dropped anomalously. So I know it's uh, a lot of anomalies and anomalies on anomalies. But yeah, that's, you know, replace the word the alg our alg replace our algorithm with a classification algorithm and you see the same picture. So following the deployment, we got alerted, we fixed it very fast and everything went back to normal very fast. We get alerted and you know, this is an example of alert that we got uh, recently where uh, uh, we saw for a customer uh, that there was a spike in the number of anomalies that we detected for that customer. So there was an anomaly in the number of anomalies for that customer, then we looked at the data, and then we saw, oh yeah, we need a new type of model. The, he started pushing a different type of signal that, we've, that we haven't thought about, and we needed to adjust and add a new model into our, to our model bank to take care of that so, so we, can, uh, we can do normal behavior on that and not give the customer false positives. So, so that's another example. Uh, here is another example where we had a distribution of the season detection algorithm, was a bug in the, in the seasonality algorithm, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this, now the point is, without this automated process that we have, we would never have been able to, to really get a grasp on what's going on in production. We wouldn't be able to scale out. Our customers would get so many false positives, they would leave us. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to improve the system continuously without this tracking. And because the scale is so large, there is no way to do this manually. I mean, you could hire a lot of people to keep track of things, but then you're wasting your resources because you know, what's the point of having learning algorithms if you can't use them on yourself as well? So just to summarize, uh, automated Anomaly detection is the first step to actually close the loop for tracking and monitoring your algorithm. Of course, there could be other steps for automation. So once you detect the anomalies are indicating, they give you the indication that something strange is happening that you haven't thought about. And then the next step is right now, you still have to go and figure that out automatically. But the next step is to start understanding these anomalies in your business context and start creating the algorithms that will automate the remediation as well. And that's, uh, but without 
the first detection and uh, and alerting, you're, you will always be blind to it. You will never know what you need to improve. So with that, I'll uh, conclude and take any questions. Yes? Right, right. Whereas the Michel Obama example was the actual algorithm not performing properly. Right. I'm not clear how your product would spot that. I mean, is it, I mean, how would you know that the Michel Obama has a website? It's true. I mean, so, so if this happens a lot, so, so the anomalies, so when you, when you create the performance metrics, you can create the distribution of the classes. So now if this happens one time, right, for one image, yeah, you, anomaly detection on one image would not work. Uh, but if now you're tracking the distribution of what your algorithms detected over time, and you start seeing that there is, there is a strange drift in it, then you, it, it often indicates there is something wrong. That's one way. The other way is to get actual feedback and then learn from that feedback. But still, when you're running a lot of models, you want, to, you, want some, you want a metric. You can't just react to any individual feedback that you get for one image or that image. You want to actually get a lot of feedback and track you know, my classification accuracy based on feedback from many, many feedbacks. And then when you see anomalies there, then you know that you need to react to it. So it's true, the Michelle Obama case, the, that individual image, Anomaly detection would not detect it, but no. If you make one mistake, you expect it to make some mistakes. Uh, but if you're starting to make a lot of mistakes, that's where it's going to help you. Uh, so in the first case, you just if you have your measures that are proxies of how good it is. So the algorithm was working perfectly, but it didn't have context. So you need to have measures that could that could indicate there is something out of context happening. So, so you still have to think about those measures. What are the right measures? And in our case, we, we, we collect about 100,000, or I think today it's 300,000 different uh, individual metrics for various parts of our algorithms. It's actually 100, but then we split it for every customer, for every type of uh, behavior. I mean, so, we, so if we aggregate it all, it's 300,000 different time series that we keep track, or well, the system keeps track all the time. Right. You could. So, so if so, that's that's so. There is some some metric engineering involved when you actually deploy it. So you have to think. Okay, what do I need to track in order to that will be a proxy that there is something wrong going on. For example, if I have text classification, right? Uh, that's saying I, I identify the objects from text, and then I have the image classification from the image. And, and I can measure, for example, how much do they agree on, or or if they have multi labels, is that is that combination very rare? So you can track that over time as well, and then you see anomalies in that. So there is so so it, it doesn't there's no free ride. You still have to think about what you need to measure about the performance of the algorithms. And if you don't think about some some cases, then the anomaly detection will not find it because you never fed it that. But but still, you can think about these things just like you do feature engineering, and you have to. And then once you and, and be be as broad as you can about it, because if you're using an automated anomaly detection, it's going to find the anomalies in all the things that you fed it. So you don't have to choose narrowly because there isn't a human looking at it, rather a system looking at it, a machine learning system looking at it. There was a question? Yeah, yeah.
So, so, oh yeah, so, so she was asking, uh, part of the process is to define what should be the performance while you're doing the training and testing, and then uh, you're already setting the expectations. So if, you, if you're looking, for example, just at classification accuracy, and you know that in your training and testing you got 98% accuracy, uh, you, you can set, if it drops below 95, alert me, very simple, kind of dumb, you don't need anything specific for that. But reality is that there are a lot of other situations that you haven't thought about uh, that are not as easy to quantify uh, or as easy to threshold. Uh, just like, you know, when I'm looking at features, my input features, I don't know what their distribution is going to, I, I know kind of what, it's, what it was during the training, but I don't want to define it because things, things uh, you know, things in production may look a little bit different. And if I hard code it, I'm going to be flooded with alerts immediately. So, so a lot of times, a lot of these measures are hard to actually baseline in your training and testing. Uh, I mean, the Alexa thing, how would you know to threshold that? I mean, how do you know, how would you know? So it's not even the algorithm that went wrong, right? The algorithm was doing perfect job. It was classifying everything perfectly, but you still, but, but still in the eyes of the user, this AI is dumb. This AI, is, this AI doesn't understand anything. So from the business perspective, you still have to create a lot of these uh, uh, performance measures that could be proxies of things that go wrong in your algorithms. Even if you haven't, if you weren't able to benchmark them in the training and testing. You mean in our platform? Yeah. So, so I try not to do too much marketing here, but yeah. So we have we have uh, it doesn't because we're we're a multi-tenant uh, platform with all the security aspects of making sure data is separated. There's no there's no way it could be joined together. And actually, you know, we do have metrics that we measure to make sure that doesn't that from security point of view that doesn't happen. Uh, Yeah, we have ways to segregate them uh, while maintaining scalability. For a customer, no, never commingling, never. Yeah, we don't do that. Uh, it actually could be interesting because we do see sometimes that there are, I mean, we have various customers where we see something happening in one, something happening in another, and we know like from the news or things that this is related, but we don't, I mean, we can visually see it, but we never do that. Yes. Oh, okay. So this is really more about semi-supervised learning. Uh, so we allow the customers to give feedback on this was a good anomaly, this was not interesting anomaly, this was a bad anomaly. What we typically do is we change some of the models that we have here. The, the, the main thing that we do right now is change the, the abnormal behavior, the scoring of the anomaly. So if somebody says this is not interesting, we start reducing the score of those anomalies to make sure that they, are, they, they won't pop up to that user anymore. So every anomaly in our system has a score between 0 and 100, and the higher it is, the more significant that anomaly is, so we, try, so we reduce it. That's what we do today. Uh, in the future, it could actually change the normal model and so on. That we do, that, that's planned. Um, typically, just to give you a sense, typically users don't give you a lot of feedback anyways. So we can't rely on it. It has to work robustly regardless. How do we calibrate the idea? Right, so, so basically when we learn the normal behavior, all our algorithms are adaptive, so they have forgetting rates in them that eventually if something changed, we'll flag it as anomalous, and then if it stays that way for long enough, it will start adapting to that new pattern automatically, and then we actually 
have, then we classify it as a pattern change anomaly, and we can alert the user saying there was a pattern change. We adapted to it. If you want to go back to where it was, do that. If you don't, then, then that's fine. And uh, how, I mean, that, that happens a lot, that things just change. It's fine. Uh, the, bias, the bias thing is usually detected. So if, so the bias thing is, is, uh, has a lot of facets to it. If, it's, if it starts biased, then yeah, anomaly detection will not detect that there was a bias because it's, it was biased from the start. So the normal is already biased and you're, I mean, then you're going to get hit from feedbacks and then you can change, you can fix that bias. But if the bias occurs over time, then things like the, like tracking the distribution of your classifier, if it's a classifier uh, and seeing that there is a change in it, that indicates there is some sort of a bias going on. Now it's still, it could be bias, it could be a new class, it could be a concept drift, uh, you would still have to, as a data scientist, go and figure it out, but at least you're aware that something's happening, so you can remediate it if it's necessary. Uh, if you're not aware, then this can go on for a long, long time until you get hit by you know, either a business, uh, business case or some news telling, you, telling the world that you're biased against you know, women or you know, any, other, any, type of, any other type of bias. But often it can lead, I mean, a lot of the biases that happen will lead to you losing money. I mean, it's not all just news. So, so once we get the feedback, it's actually it's automatically fed into it and and applied immediately because a lot of the models usually the feedback on is on something specific, and then the model for that metric or group of of metrics gets updated, you know, immediately as the feedback comes. I mean, it's not every feedback gets treated with a weight. We are very Bayesian about it, so it changes the prior distribution of that model and then uh, so, so so I would say immediate a minute something like that I mean that's our usually usually our scale is any change that happens it happens within a minute thank you